Uh, If you've been here for any length of time, you know that we as a church uh, are talking about how we want to be a people on mission. We want to be going. We don't want to just stay inside these walls and and in our chairs and and get kind of fat and happy. We want to make sure that we are getting outside these walls and making some noise for Jesus, whether that's in our family, whether that's in our neighborhood, our coworkers, our schoolmates. We want to make sure, even as a church collectively, we want to be out in the city making some noise for Jesus, going out on mission. And so we talked all about how we need to go. And then, of course, all of February, we talked about how we could go. We could have all these gifts, all these talents, be able to do all these things. But if we don't go in love, then we are dead. And we talked about how we want love to be our loudest language. And today, we're going to be looking at a guy named Jonah. And I like to think that this is the application of 1 Corinthians 13. Because Jonah, he had gifts, he had talents, he was called by God, he was a prophet, he had the words of God inside of him, but he did not have the heart of God. And so what we're going to be looking at here is uh, how not to be Jonah when God calls us to go to our Nineveh, whether that's a place or whether that's something in our own lives, and our own hearts that we need to deal with. And so we're going to look at that throughout this series. And this week, even as I was preparing for Jonah in reading over the last couple of weeks, I came across a guy named Roy Riggles. Now, chances are, none of you know who that guy is. It might kind of sound familiar. You might know it, especially if you're a big football fan, you'll know who he is. Um, he was an all-American football player who played for the University of California, Berkeley, the Golden Bears. And in 1929, that's how big of a football fan you need to be. In 1929, they faced off against Georgia Tech. And uh, uh, they were in the Rose Bowl. And Georgia Tech had the football, and they're running. And in the second quarter, Georgia Tech fumbles the football. And there's Roy, and he runs in, and he grabs it, and he starts sprinting and running some 69 uh, yards to to the end zone. The problem is, is that he was running toward the wrong end zone. He was going the wrong way. In fact, Georgia Tech's head coach, watching all of this in disbelief, he's yelling at his teammates. He's like, hey, guys, sit down. Shut up. Let him go. Act like this is normal. Don't lead on that he's going the wrong way. He said every step in the wrong direction that he takes is to our advantage. And so Roy is running towards that end zone. Thankfully, a teammate sprinted after him, was running after him, and caught him at the one-yard line. And he stopped and he was like, hey, Roy, you're going the wrong way. You need to be going that way. And from that point on, his name was not Roy Riggles anymore. It was Wrong Way Roy. Now, my question for us today is, have you ever felt like Wrong Way Roy before? Maybe at some point in your life, the Lord told you to go in one direction. And for one reason or another, you went the opposite direction. Maybe you're here right now and you're in a place in a season where you are running from God's plans and his purpose for your life. Maybe God is calling you to serve somewhere, be in a group, to give a little bit more. And you're like, I know that's what you want from me, Lord. I know that's what you've called me to do, but I'm gonna run the other way. Maybe there's something inside of you. The Lord's saying, hey, you need to deal with your anger. You need to deal with your addiction. You need to deal with your language. And you're like, I know I need to do that, Lord, but I'll get to that later. And you're running the other way way. The truth is, many of us choose to be like Jonah, running the opposite direction of what God's will and purpose and plans is for our life. See, the Bible never tells us if Jonah ever had a nickname, but if he did, I bet you it would be wrong way Jonah. Because God clearly and specifically called Jonah to go in one direction, but when God said go, Jonah said no. And that's the title of today's message. When God said go, Jonah said no. Now, when you heard me say that we're going to be going verse by verse through the book of Jonah, I think for some of you who grew up in church or had kids in the church, the first thing that comes to your mind is the VeggieTales movie. Some of you, you don't even know what VeggieTales is, and uh, I didn't grow up on VeggieTales. I know what it is. It's just a bunch of talking vegetables. And uh, one of the famous movies that VeggieTales did was they did uh, Jonah. And so for some of you who grew up in the church or had kids, you watched the VeggieTales movie. That's immediately what you start thinking of. Or maybe you're like me. You think about it uh, like eating sushi in reverse. Instead of man eating a fish, it's a fish eating a man, you know? 
But I think a lot of us, when we think about Jonah, a lot of times our minds immediately go, well, isn't that just a kid's story? Like, isn't that just for kids, children's church? Isn't that what that's for? Like, what does it have to do with my life? What is it, how could I apply this to my life? I think a lot of times, too, we make the book of Jonah more about winning an argument about could this really happen? We argue, we get on the the Google and we start typing in, like, can this happen? We try to present all of our scientific evidence, like, here's why this could happen. Here's why this is possible. Here's some history on men being swallowed by fish before. And so we make it more about winning an argument to try to verify the story than what I think the author of Jonah was really wanting us to wrestle with. See, the story is less about a fish. Three verses, three times, a fish is mentioned. So it's less about a fish and more about the greatness of our God. God is mentioned all throughout this story. I believe this is what we're going to find out. Will we allow ourselves to be consumed by the mission and the heart of a great God? So, Let's dive in, pun intended. It's the only one I'm going to have. So there's a lot. Let me tell you, these commentators really think they're punny, and that is, it's rough sometimes to read. Jonah chapter 1, verse 1. Now the word of the Lord came to Jonah, the son of Amittai, saying, Arise, go to Nineveh, that great city, and call out against it, for their evil has come up before me. But Jonah rose to flee to Tarshish, From the presence of the Lord, he went down to Joppa and found a ship going to Tarshish. So he paid the fare and went down into it to go with them to Tarshish away from the presence of the Lord. So there's really two big ideas I want us to leave with today. That when God tells us to go, we can avoid saying no like Jonah did. And the first idea is this. God will speak, but it may not be what you want to hear. God will speak, but it may not be what you want to hear. Now, Jonah, he's a prophet. And prophets in the Old Testament, they were people who were used by God uh, to communicate God's message to the world. And Jonah knows that it's God's right to send prophets all over the world to communicate that message. But the problem that we're introduced here is, what if the mission isn't right? See, Jonah knows what God is up to. God does not need Jonah if God wants to destroy Nineveh. Jonah knows that by God sending him over to Nineveh, God is actually for Nineveh. And if he preaches and they respond, God will get his heart's desire and not destroy Nineveh. And Jonah believes Nineveh needs to be destroyed. He believes they deserve to be destroyed. And a lot of times we're like Jonah. We feel like we know what's best. And we don't want to obey when the word of the Lord comes to us. Now, what's the word of the Lord that bothers Jonah so much, that gets under his skin? What does he not want to obey? Verse 2 tells us, God said to him, Arise and go to Nineveh, that great city, call out against it or preach against it, for their evil has come up before me. Now, you might be wondering, this is his job. Why is he not doing it? Like, this is what he does. He preaches God's word. Why doesn't he just obey this very simple assignment? Well, to understand, you have to understand the history of Nineveh and understand why so many people hated him and why Jonah hated them. See, whenever Nineveh was attacking another country, another city, another town, they were so brutal, they were so destructive that it was rumored that when they were going into a city or into a town, that whole town would rather just commit suicide than experience what they might experience through the Ninevites. Nineveh was feared. They were hated. And just how bad was it? Well, it's been said that they would, when they would go over and they would take over a city, they would kill all sorts of people right off the bat. Then they would take the captive all the women and they would rape them and then they would murder them. Then they would take all the kids and they would torture the children. And then they would take the husbands as prisoners of war. And then they would take them outside the city walls in the middle of the desert, skin them alive, bury them in the desert sand up into their necks. Then they would take out their tongues, ram a spear through it so that their mouths were wide open, dying of thirst in the middle of the desert while they were physically dying. You can imagine just how painful and how awful this is. 
And after that they went through this desert and they did all these things, after everybody was dead, they would come through and lob off all the heads of all these dead guys. And then they would build a pyramid of heads outside the city saying, this city was conquered by Nineveh. Now, when we understand that background of how feared and hated they were by other people, when Jonah said, I don't want to go there. I hate those people. I think we could have a little more grace and mercy on Jonah. And God tells him, I want you to do something. And in Jonah's mind, he had a legitimate reason why he didn't need to obey. Now, this isn't the first time Jonah's ever heard God speak to him. In fact, 2 Kings chapter 14, uh, you can read it later, God speaks to Jonah. And God tells Jonah, hey, go tell the children of Israel, their borders are expanding. Bring some good news to them. So Jonah does that. And that's very unlike the other prophets. Prophets of that day normally talk about sin and condemnation, but Jonah gets to bring this good news that their borders are expanding. In fact, if Time Magazine had popular prophets of the year, Jonah would have been on the cover of that. But now God calls him to leave what's familiar and step into what's unfamiliar. See, the good news for us here today is God is a God who loves to speak. And not only did God speak to Jonah, God will also speak to us today. In fact, when God spoke, when he was creating everything, he said, let there be. And he spoke and things came into existence. When he created Adam and Eve, he wanted to talk to them in the garden. All throughout history, God is a God who loves to speak and he speaks in different ways. He spoke in an audible voice. He speaks through his prophets. He has spoken through circumstances. He's spoken through his Holy Spirit. And if you've never heard the voice of God today, the good news is you can. All you need to do is open up his word and he will speak to you. You're like, I don't know where to start. Good, I'm glad, because we have this as well. Our Bible reading plan. You can get it online. You, you can pick it up in the lobby here. You can take this one if you want. God is a God who loves to speak and he will speak to us. It tells us that God's word is living and active and sharper than any two-edged sword. The word of the Lord will come to you. God will speak to you and it will change you and it will move you and it will give you an opportunity to be obedient to him. But you always will have a choice. You can do what the word of the Lord is. You can obey God. Or you could do what Jonah did and run the other way and say, I know what's best. I don't want to obey what God says. God is a God who will speak. But sometimes it may not be what you want to hear. The word of the Lord will come to you. That's the good news. The challenging news, though, for us is when God comes to you, he will often ask you to do things that you don't want to do. And the reason why we don't want to do those things is because we really like to believe we know what's best. We like to try to convince ourselves that we really know What's better? For example, how many of you here today, by a show of hands, love chocolate ice cream? Like you love chocolate ice cream, right? Okay, you can put your hands down. How many of you love vanilla ice cream? That's your favorite, yeah? How many of you just adore, because I feel like that's the word you should use, strawberry ice cream? You love a few of you? Yep, there's a few of you out there, yeah? Strawberry ice cream. But how many times do we like to go, are you kidding me? Strawberry ice cream? Vanilla ice cream? Have you ever had chocolate ice cream? That's the best. You can have it milky. You can have it dark. You can have it all kinds of different ways. It's the best. And the vanilla people will be like, have you had homemade vanilla ice cream? There's all kinds of different ways to have vanilla ice cream. And we like to argue because we like to believe we know what's best. And sometimes someone in authority or with more knowledge will come to us and say, this is what I want you to do. And you'll go, well, I don't feel like doing that. I know what's best. The word of the Lord will come to you. You will hear specifically from God, this is what I want you to do. And in our minds, we play out the scenario, okay, God, I get, I understand that this is what you want me to do, but I don't want to do it. I don't want to have anything to do with this. For some of us, God has come to you and he's told you, hey, I want you to go and forgive that person. I know they hurt you. I know they wronged you. I know they did some things to you or to a loved one, but you need to go to that person. You can go, I understand that's what you want me to do, God, but they don't deserve it. Do you know what they did to me? I know that that's you, you forgiven me and you tell me that I should forgive others, but I don't want to do it, God. We run the other way. 
comes to our finances. The word of the Lord will come to you and say, hey, you're supposed to give. It's a way of showing that you trust me. Everything I've given you, your job, your money, your resources, all of that has come from my hand. And we're taught that as an act of worship, as a way of showing that we trust God with our finances, we just give 10% back to worship him for what he's given to us. And a lot of us go, well, I know that's what God wants me to do, but it doesn't make sense in my mind. I like my stuff more than I like to be obedient to God. I don't want to do it. Or maybe for you, you're here today and you're dating somebody. And he's just so cute. Oh, she just smells so much better than my friends. And so you get these tingly, wingly feelings all inside. You get the butterflies every time they walk in the room. And before you know it, you've been messing around and doing some things you shouldn't be doing. And the word of the Lord comes to you. And he's telling you, hey, sex is for marriage. It's not for dating. That's not how I designed it. That's not the intended use of it. And you have a choice. You can do what the word of the Lord says and you can obey and go, I know, God, you're not trying to rob me of anything. I know that you're not trying to uh, ruin my life, that you created, it was your design, you had a certain context for it, and I'm going to obey what you say. Or you can say, I know that's what God says, but I want to have sex. I want to cheat on my spouse. I want to look at pornography. I want to be addicted to these things. I want to find my identity in all these other things. And we could easily be like, I don't really care what God says. This makes me feel good. This makes me feel loved. The truth is, Jonah is inside all of us. We are more like Jonah than we'd like to think that we are. The word of the Lord will come to you. And he will say, this is what you're supposed to do. But for some of us, we go, well, I don't want to do that. Or we'll be convicted and we'll go, okay, I don't want to do that. I'll get to that later. Let me have some fun right now. But remember, delayed obedience is still disobedience. Delayed obedience is still disobedience. You know what it's like, parents. Tell your kids, do this, don't do that. Would you do this, do that? Sometimes they just sit there and they look at you. Maybe it's just me. But they're pondering and they're wondering what's going on. And they're wondering, how much trouble can I get into, right? And we always do the classic line, do what I say on the count of three. One, two, I'm serious, two and a half. Like, don't make me go over there. What are we teaching our kids? Delayed obedience. Delayed obedience is really disobedience. The word of the Lord will come to you. God will tell you to do some things that you don't want to do. And just like Jonah we go, I don't want to go there. I don't want to do that. And basically what we're telling God is we're like, hey, God, you're really, really good. You're really, really smart sometimes. But this time you're wrong. The book of Jonah is written to help us face the truth that sometimes we know what God wants, but we just don't want to do it. So the question I want us to wrestle with today is, what is your Nineveh? What is your Nineveh? Jonah's story is wrapped up in his belief of who his enemies should be. Jonah wanted to pick and choose who deserved God's love. Jonah wanted to pick and choose who deserved to hear the truth about God. And he ran from his enemies and he ran from obedience to God. But here's the problem. We serve a God who runs toward his enemies. The Bible tells us that while we were still sinners, while we were the enemies of God, God sent Jesus to live and die and rise again for us. And so if we're ever going to look like Jesus, be like Jesus, we need to run toward the people that we often want to run away from. And so for some of you today, you need to run back to that marriage. Run back to that person that hurts you. Run back to that person that you doesn't look like you, act like you, vote like you. Because here's the reality. You never assume that your enemies are God's enemies. God has a heart for the world. God will speak to you. And at times he will tell you things that you do not want to hear. But when that Nineveh call comes, there will always be a boat named disobedience waiting at the dock. And that brings us to our second and last point. You can always find a boat 
sailing in the wrong direction. There will always be a boat waiting to sail in the wrong direction. Now, some of you, you know what I'm talking about. At one point in your life, you're like, you know what? I want to obey God. I want to do what God's called me to do. And then all of a sudden, a friend or the enemy will come up to you and whisper in your ear, you don't really want to do that. You don't want to go there. You want to go back to the way things used to be. Go back to that old life. Watch how it happens here in Jonah. God says, I want you to preach against the Ninevites. And then in verse 3, But Jonah rose to flee to Tarshish from the presence of the Lord. He went down to Joppa and found a ship going to Tarshish. So he paid the fare and went down into it to go with them to Tarshish, away from the presence of the Lord. In fact, I want to show you a map here. It's uh, kind of just to visualize a little bit of where Jonah was. He's there in Joppa, and the Lord's like, hey, go east to Nineveh, 550 miles away. And Jonah's like, no, I got this. I'm going to go the other way. I'm going to go west, 2,500 miles the other direction. I read this week that it would take a whole year to sail that direction. That's a lot of running. Jonah did not share God's concern for the world, and so he was ready to go to the end of the world to keep God from making a big mistake. See, in the Jewish mind, that literally was where their maps ended. That was the end of the world in the Jewish mind. And he was willing to go that far because he believed God was going to make a big mistake. So what do you do when God wants you to do something that you think is wrong? You know, for some of us, the word of the Lord has come to you in the past, and God says, this is what I want you to do. And somewhere along the way, we go, no, 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 no. I know what's best, Lord. I know that's what you want me to do, God, but I don't want to obey you. And you've been on the run, and you think that you can get away with it. See, you need to understand something. You can run for a while, but you cannot run forever because it'll eventually catch up to you. But maybe you're not so much on the run as much as you're slowly drifting. In fact, I remember this time. um, I was out years ago with Pastor Devon, and uh, he had a boat at this time, and uh, he said, hey, it's getting uh, to be really nice outside, kind of getting sick of this winter weather. You want to go on the river with me? Now, I hate the Cumberland. In fact, I have called it the Scumberland. I don't know, maybe you guys call it that too, but it's just kind of dirty and nasty and it kind of creeps me out. It's not like Destin water where you can see the water. You know, you can see your feet underneath the water. It's just dirty and grimy and gross. And I hear the kind of catfish that live in that river and it kind of freaks me out anyways. But I was like, you know what? You're right. I'm done with this winter weather. I want to get out there too. I got to work on my tan. And so I was like, let's do it. So we get out on his boat, and he gets to his spot, and he's like, well, I got to do some work real quick, which made me feel like the child, and I was just out on the boat with dad, but, um, <laughs> so it made me feel very irresponsible, but I was like, okay, cool. So he dropped the anchor, and I got on a little inner tube, and I just kind of was like, let me listen to some music, I'll pray, you know, I'll just kind of hang out, work on the tan a little bit, all that kind of stuff. And so I'm out there, and I'm just kind of enjoying all of it. And then all of a sudden I go, well, you know, I'm a little hot and I'm thirsty now. So I'm going to swing by and get a drink uh, on the boat. And so I kind of look up and all of a sudden I do not see the boat anywhere. And I was like, yeah, he would just leave me out here. Like this would be, this would be what he would do. This is terrible. Now I'm going to have to go thumb a ride on Riverside with this giant inner tube. And so I start panicking. I'm like, where is he? Like this can't be happening right now. And so I'm looking all around, and so I start paddling a little bit. And what ended up happening is we came to a bend in the river. He hadn't moved. He set anchor. I was the one who was slowly drifting from the boat. And for some of you, you're here today. And at one time, you were walking with the Lord. You were really close to the Lord. You were praying, but not only at just mealtime. You were praying to work. You were praying to school. You were praying when you were coming home from work. You were praying when you were coming home from school. You were constantly in communication with the Lord, talking to him. And you would pick up God's word, whether in the morning or at night, and you would read. And it was like the words were just leaping off the pages, speaking to you. And you would come to church, and it was like you were the only one in the room, and God was speaking directly to you. And then one day you just skipped church. And then the next week, you did it again. 
And he kind of popped online when it was convenient. And then eventually he stopped praying. He stopped opening up God's word. And all of a sudden you stopped seeing the God activities in your life. And then one day you thought to yourself, how did I get this far from God? It wasn't that you were running. It was that you were slowly drifting from him. When we disobey the commands of God, whether intentionally or unintentionally, we are drifting. We are separating ourselves from him. That's the Jonah inside all of us. So the question I want to ask you today is, where is your Tarshish? Where is your Tarshish? Where is the place that you like to run to to avoid what God wants you to do? Is it your career? Is it your hobbies? Is it TV, video games, movies, social media? For some of us, it's religion. We go, you know what, I'll read my Bible. I don't want to tithe, but I'll read my Bible. God, I, I, I don't want to share my faith with this person at work because he's a jerk. He deserves to go somewhere. I'm not going to do that, but I'll get an awakened group. There will always be a boat waiting to go in the wrong direction. Don't expect God to give you peace in your heart about selected obedience. God is determined to relentlessly pursue you, and here's why. Because God doesn't take no for an answer. You see, if God's only focus was on Nineveh, he would have just found someone else to go and preach against it. But God was after Jonah. He comes after Jonah, not because he needs Jonah, but because Jonah needs him. And the same is true for us today. God will relentlessly pursue you. You might be here and you might be far from Christ right now. God is pursuing you right now, not because he needs you, but because you need him. We're never going to become our best until we agree with God or with what God says is best. So you can leave, but God will not leave you alone, as we're going to find out next week. Even though we may run in the opposite way, the opposite direction, there's always the opportunity for redemption. In fact, I want to go back to that story with Wrong Way Roy. Scooped up the ball, he ran the opposite direction, his teammates saved him from scoring points for the other team, it's halftime. And he gets back and, and Roy's all distraught and he's aggravated and he's frustrated with himself. And he goes, coach, I can't face that crowd again. I can't go back out there. I've ruined you. I've ruined myself. I've ruined the team. I've ruined the university. There's no way that I could get back out there again. And the coach looks at him and he's like, hey, Roy, the game's only half over. You need to get back out there in the second half. And Roy did what his coach said, and he turned in one of the most inspiring efforts in Rose Bowl history. Here's the application for us today. You might be here, and in your heart, you know that you are running from God. You are going the opposite direction. God told you to go one way, but you're running the opposite way. You're doing things in your life that you know that you shouldn't be doing as a follower of Jesus. And just like the Georgia Tech head coach, the enemy is saying, keep going. Keep going the wrong direction. Keep going that way because every step you take in the wrong direction is to his advantage. But God is a God of second chances. God is a God who loves. God is a God who gives grace, love, mercy, forgiveness, redemption too. You might be here today and you might have messed up the first half of your life. But the good news is, if you turn to Jesus, he can redeem the second half. Amen. 